we're learning about this thing called saras, which we translate as leprosy. But the, the, the leprosy that we're aware of today is not the same at all as the leprosy that the Torah is talking about. This leprosy came as punishment for bad talk, Lashon Hara. But the Rebbe asks the obvious question, Miriam got leprosy because she spoke badly of Moshe Rabbeinu, her brother. The Rebbe asks, if Miriam, who was a tzaddik, and didn't say anything terrible about her brother. In fact, she was right. And even God himself agreed with her that she's right, just that Moshe was an exception. And Moshe took no offense because Moshe was the most humble person on earth. So if she gets leprosy for what she said, which was so uh, innocent, relatively, why don't people today get leprosy for all the Lashon Hara that is real, malicious Lashon Hara, and they don't get leprosy? We have a Sunday night program for VIPs that you might be interested in. It's informal, it's questions and answers, it's conversation. It's really relaxed, it's really pleasant enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. Just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us, take a look, click uh, the link below and see which, which of the three suits you best and join us for some enjoyable conversation. So the Rebbe says, this is obviously a different kind of leprosy. It's a different kind of Lashonara. There is Lashon Hara that is harmful to the person you're speaking of. It's also harmful to you and it's harmful to the person who's listening. But it is damaging human beings. There's another Lashon Hara where it's not anyone getting damaged or hurt or insulted or offended. It's doing something bad, not to the person you're speaking of, but to the faculty of speech. Any, any function, any talent, any human uh, ability that is abused is bad. You corrupt um, a God-given gift by abusing it, that's Lashon Hara. Using your Lashon, using speech in a way that it is not appropriate for speech. So you try to use a butter knife as a screwdriver, you know you're going to cause some damage to the knife. So there's a certain kind of talking, a certain kind of speech that uh, is offensive to speech itself. The Rebbe would say many times after speaking to somebody, he would say, I hope you're not going to cause me to have spoken Dvarim Betelin. Idle talk. What's idle talk? Talk that doesn't bring results. So after speaking to somebody, the Rebbe would say, don't, don't cause me to have spoken idle talk by not following through and by not doing what we talked about. Because just talk is idle. Which means something like this. Talking is not just making words and sounds with your mouth. Speech means communication. 
That's, that's what speech was created for. That's its job, that's its function. To communicate. The first result of communication is closeness. When you communicate with someone, you feel closer to them. Because in communicating, you, you share something of yourself. If you're just speaking math, two mathematicians discussing math, that's not necessarily communication. Because they both happen to enjoy math and they share it with each other, it is a shared pleasure, so it can bring them together. But just the subject itself does not express the speaker and uh, does not bring him any closer to the listener. So what is the essence of speech? The essence of speech is communicating something about yourself. So thought is thought is purely for yourself. It's not communication. And that's why thinking something complimentary about somebody, but not telling him does not bring you any closer. Because in thought, you're living in your own world. You're not sharing any part of yourself. When you're thinking out loud, <laughs> you're still not sharing anything about yourself because you're living in the world of your own thoughts. Speaking means stepping out of yourself. But stepping out of yourself doesn't mean being detached from yourself. It means giving a piece of yourself to someone else. It doesn't have to be extremely profound, but something has to be communicated about you. You reveal yourself in speech. And that's what we read in the Haggadah, which we will soon be doing. Chacha mahu oimer. What does the wise son say? Rosha mahu oimer. What does the wicked son say? And so on. You can also read it. Rosha mahu. The Rosha, what he is, oimer, he says. Chacham mahu oimer. What he is, he says. In other words, in his in their question, in their speech, who they are is revealed. That's called communication. That is the art of speech. I'm not uh, familiar with uh, the world of animals, but the difference between animal communication and human communication is that animals can communicate facts. I'm hungry, I'm angry. But just the fact, it's not personal sharing who I am. Only a human being has this capacity to reveal himself in words. So if you use speech that does not communicate, then you're abusing this talent corrupting it, or whatever word you want to use. So Lashon Hara can be bad for the subject of your conversation, who you're talking about, or it can be bad for the speech itself. By very special people, like Miriam, using words inappropriately is considered a great uh, failing. For average people, this is not a sin. 
So two things. First of all, we don't get leprosy today because the, the lush and hara that brings leprosy is only uh, objectionable in people who are on that level where everything they say is purposeful and meaningful and, and meant to produce results. Um, the average person, if he speaks and doesn't produce results or doesn't really express himself, that would not be considered a sin or a failing and doesn't deserve any kind of punishment. Secondly, it's not a punishment really. Can't say Miriam was punished. It's actually like a, a hypersensitivity or a gift from above. When your words are starting to fail in their effect or in their communication. From heaven, the person is given a sign or a reminder that the speech is not happy with how it's being used. And that's where the leprosy came. Today, we don't deserve that kind of sign from heaven. And number three, it's not leprosy the way we think it is. Today, leprosy is a very serious disease. It's a horrible disease. Back then, it was simply a spot on your skin. It's like a little sign from heaven. And I was wondering, is there a similar abuse of actions? or of thought, or of emotions? Is there some kind of a sign that special people get from heaven if they're using their thoughts inappropriately? If they're using action inappropriately. In other words, even if the act is not an act of a sin, it's a purely innocent act, but it is not what actions are supposed to be for, just like when you speak and, and not accomplish anything. I haven't found anything. Of course, we're told that sitting around wasting time is a sign of wickedness. idle people, but is wasting time the abuse of your talents or the abuse of time itself? So idle talk is the abuse of speech, but idle waste of time is not the abuse of actions because it's an inaction, it's the abuse of time. Thoughts. Obviously, thoughts are much more sensitive than action or speech. And therefore, the way you think is crucial to who you are and how you, how you make it through life. So that even if, this, if the thought is not vulgar or sinful or evil, we have to be careful how we use our thoughts. I don't know of any sign from heaven, but certainly there are thoughts that are encouraging and there are thoughts that are depressing. So this is what our, this week's Parsha is talking about the different kinds of leprosy and how do you measure it and how do you... It was a divine gift back in those days when people were in such a 
high level where if they were slightly abusing a, a, a gift, a faculty that God gave, God would send them a little reminder to get them back on track. What's amazing, which we have to keep reminding ourselves, there is nothing in the Torah that is ordinary. Yeah, she was there, I talk lush and horror, you say bad things about people and you spread gossip and slander and so on, you're gonna get punished with leprosy. There's, there's always more to the story than that. And when we find it, it feels so right. It's eye-opening, it's, it, it's a pleasure to the soul to hear the soulful side of every idea, halacha, commandment, story in the Torah. That's why we didn't really appreciate what Torah was until we started learning Chassidus. We were 16 and our teacher opened our eyes to what Torah really is. And whoa, that's a different, completely different experience. And today, <clears throat> people who are not members of the Chabad community or family who have other customs, other lifestyles and in Judaism, and they're discovering Hasidus, Chabad Hasidus, Tanya, the Rebbe's talks, Sichas. It's like oxygen. They didn't realize how starved they were for oxygen in, in, their, in their Yiddishkeit, in their observance, and their strict observance. But it was like working and not breathing. And this brought oxygen into their, into their observance, into their mitzvahs, into their study of Torah. And it's a pleasure to see how enthusiastic they are and how excited they're getting. Until recently, somebody said to me, and I think this is really good news. He was quoting Tanya to me. And I said to him, you know, you keep this up, you're going to become a Lubavitcher. You're going to become Chabad. And he says, don't you realize what's going on? In a few years, Tanya will no longer belong to Chabad. It'll belong to everyone. That was nice to hear. Because that was the original intention of the Tanya. This was not meant for a certain group or for a certain uh, location or geographic uh, location in Russia or in Europe or wherever Chabad people settled. This was the inner dimension of the Torah, which is everyone's property and inheritance. And so when it's starting to catch on that way and people are saying, it's our Torah, not yours, that's that's what we were waiting to hear. And the spreading of Hasidus, the Hafotzas Hamayanis, the Mashiach told the Baal Shem Tev that he will arrive, he will come and be revealed when the Baal Shem Tev's teachings are spread to the outside. Now, what does it mean spread to the outside? Heard of? There are Jews all over the world who will know that certain people study the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov. That's not actually spread. The spread outside means to belong to everyone beyond the confines of Chabad community. So now that we've been successful with that, the Baal Shem Tov's teachings have spread and continue to spread to where others are now owning it. 
This is our Torah. Now Mashiach can certainly come. We have fulfilled his condition. So maybe a few more Jews have to catch on and tip the scale. But certainly the condition is being met. Hasidus is spread way beyond the Chabad community. In fact, the Chabad community itself is starting to uh, shed its borders. What is a Chabad community? Who belongs in the Chabad community? Every Jew of every background, of every culture, of every country, of, of every tradition. It has become universal. Non-Jews who frequent Chabad houses, they call themselves Chabad. Chabad non-Jews. It's, it is very encouraging. If you enjoyed this conversation or this topic and you're looking for more information or you want to hear it again from another angle, there is a way to do that. And that is in this book. It's all there. Order it from Amazon. You can read it, reread it, and share it.